thank you, thank you for everybody for being here. So my name is Jan and I'm a researcher at uh, uh, yeah, the School of Economics and at Lockbell and the University of Technology. And uh, I was asked to give what this, well, I, I suppose to give you a fun for the day. I suppose this is not going to be that much fun. But I, I hope that I can give you some hope. Hmm. So, so uh, I'll be talking uh, today about this, um, where we are right now in the environment. I'll be talking about our uh, project, and we can basically planning for rapid uh, decarbonization of the society. And, uh, well, if we have time, uh, maybe I'll also have, uh, have something to say about, what, uh, about the role of libraries in what is going to be happening. Uh, but let's go forward. There's your thing Oh, okay, this looks more familiar to me. Um, okay. So where we are right now? Uh, well, of course we are now in Bruce, but uh, Charlie, we are talking about these environmental uh, things. Well, uh, this, is, this is something that you probably don't see very well. Sorry about the But um, but this is what uh, one of the leading uh, climate scientists in the world said by just like last September. He was Joachim Zelenkamp, professor from Germany. And he actually said that I would like people to panic. And just like was like yesterday or day before that, uh, uh, the chief negotiator for the uh, for the climate change agreements uh, also came out and said that uh, now is the time for civil disobedience. Uh, not why civil disobedience is <coughs> she's uh, supporting that. So why? Uh, what are uh, scientists say these things? Well, this is uh, Professor Schellenhuber's estimate that uh, if we go into this, uh, what he calls runaway climate effect, the damage from that alone uh, might be something well, in between like the entire GDP of the whole world, all the wealth in the whole world, and something like global loss of civilization. And uh, <clears throat> what is probably here is that uh, this is not certain. Please don't listen to anyone who says that uh, we are definitely doomed, even if it's me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, because uh, these are all those probabilities. The future is not written in stone. We are, we are writing, but it's not written yet. But the probability that something like this might happen is very uncomfortably high. Would any of you fly with a plane that has a 10% chance of crashing? Or would you force your kids to be a plane like that? But I think that you all know this. I, I shouldn't be preaching to you so much because basically you know this already. So <coughs> you know that this thing is bad. What I'd like to emphasize is that uh, this is actually my main field. I, I study the mitigation of climate change and, and technologies that are related to the mitigation of climate change. So I, uh, I would say that I, within my specialty, when I say that I agree with this, this was a uh, study uh, commissioned by the British government about the technological possibilities for decarbonization. And while we have to uh, keep on continuing to, uh, you know, to develop new technologies, uh, this is it. We basically don't have any more time to you know, rely on some kind of technology. Even a very simple uh, invention can take something like 10 years from 
from laboratory to widespread deployment, and we don't have that much time. So we have to start acting now with everything we have. Fortunately, uh, what we have will be enough. So what we have to do, just to uh, put this in perspective, yes, I, uh, estimate of, of uh, total emissions in the world, T total uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in 2015, this is a little detail of slide, uh, it was something like in the order of uh, 75,000, uh, sorry, 50,000 uh, uh, million tons of carbon dioxide in the world. Now, where we are headed, uh, based on uh, on, this is based on, on current climate policies in the world. What uh, countries are actually doing, and what they have promised to do, is somewhere, somewhere in there, this is something like 75,000 uh, 75, uh, uh, But where we, we need to be by that time in, in 30 years is at least here, and we hope to be there. So this is a, this is going to be a you know big town. So uh, especially because at the same time, uh, at the same time that we try to uh, stop climate change, we would have to stop biodiversity loss uh, and in general try to reverse the degradation of the environment. Climate change is not the only problem. We are not talking a lot about climate change, but. Uh, we are facing a broader sustainability crisis. Uh, where for example, climate change loss might already be equally serious problem as climate change. There are other uh, so-called planetary boundaries that we know of at least nine. And we are reaching quite rapidly two more in addition to climate and biodiversity. Mm -hmm. These are uh, the phosphorus and nitrogen, nitrogen cycles in the environment. Mm -hmm. So this is not just a climate mm -hmm. problem. We have, we have to solve multiple problems at the same time. Well, otherwise, what might happen is, well, how many of you remember this game? <laughs> yeah, great. This is, this is the best game. I had this, this exact cell phone, right? This was my first cell phone. Uh, <clears throat> And this is, this is a fantastic uh, game and it's an excellent demonstration of the problem of the eye. Because uh, we are now making a high score in this game called civilization. But unfortunately we have driven our civilization to a situation that's pretty much like that. And that is uh, the, the space, the so-called safe operating space for humanity is uh, diminishing rapidly. And, and as we grow more and more, uh, we diminish the safe operating space more and more. So this is a perfect analogy for that situation that we are in. And now the big question is that, is this going to be my, our destiny? That, uh, can we do something about this? I think we can. But I'm not going to be selling you any kind of like technical solution or technocratic uh, uh, solution, although our plan has some aspect of this kind of like, uh, uh, you know, technocratic solution that let's solve this with them. But I'm saying straight now, straight away, that this is a problem that is impossible to solve with technology alone. We have to change our thinking. We have to change our relationship uh, to the rest of the planet and to each other. I'm personally quite convinced that this is going to require increased uh, equality uh, within countries and between countries. We have to learn how to live on this planet together. Otherwise, we, we have, because we have the means to destroy our civilization, we can't destroy the planet, but we can destroy our own civilization uh, unless we learn how to live. But now we are going to buy a little bit more time in which to make this change in our thinking. It's basically that we, we are going to be uh, looking at the time 
when we were able to do something like what we now do. We have a project called Plan B, and it's uh, in principle, it's an emergency decarbonization plan, and nobody sees this. Okay, I'll be just. <laughs> so it, uh, it's an emergency decarbonization plan uh, with mass production on a truly epic scale. This is based on a, a realization that what we are now doing with, with this kind of uh, infrastructure change that we have to do in order to, you know, decarbonize our societies, this is simply not happening in a, uh, fast enough. We are building, you know, a couple of windmills here and there, a little bit there and so forth, but we are not even close to the scale that is now required, required for us. But we can do this. This is a, uh, this picture is, is uh, this is from a one factory. One of five that were built just to make this one type of an airplane back in 1940s. They had an assembly line a mile long and uh, this factory was pushing out the flight ready bomber every 59 minutes. One bomber in an hour. Every day. And it's kind of, uh, uh, as, a, you know, as a technology, as a uh, mechanical thing, these bombers are surprisingly close to wind power plants, not just because they have these propellers, mm -hmm. but otherwise as well. We could be doing this to wind power plants, for example. Or we could be doing the same thing that uh, people 80 years ago did with ships. Uh, the Allied powers had this problem in the Second World War, that the Germans were sinking the transport ships, and they needed to, you know, deliver everything to England. So the solution was to build so many ships that the Germans couldn't be sink them fast enough. And uh, some of you probably have heard of these Liberty ships. And when the first Liberty ship was manufactured in 1941, uh, it took 230 days to construct. And it was considered to be a very fast build because it, it didn't have any luxuries. It was just a basic ship. So anyone wants, wants to guess that what was, by the end of the war, what was the record time of building one of those ships? Any ideas? A week? A week? A year? Pretty much two months. It was four days, uh, 15 hours, and 30 minutes. Four days? Yes. And, and the average time to construct a ship of that, that type was 11 days. So, uh, so they were building like something like 50 ships a day. In addition to everything else, like those airplanes and atomic bombs and whatever. What we have to be doing uh, in, in uh, this time is that we have to take on at the same time multiple uh, problems in the infrastructure because we have to clean up the energy. Energy sector we have to clean up from transportation, we have to clean up construction, food and farming, we have to reduce uh, uh, forest and land use, we have to take into account social and health services, and cultural, uh, cultural and uh, practices, education, everything. And we ha may have to develop means how to do so-called uh, geoengineering and how to reduce ocean acidification. So we have to do a lot of things, but today I'll be just using as an example this energy. What we are, we are going to be doing, I have funding for like four years of this project and we are seeking more funding to get like more people working in this. What we are planning to do is, is to make a at least a draft plan that takes into account all, all of this. But I'll be talking about energy only now because we only have an hour and mm. that's a fairly important point. Mm. Then we have to go with, uh, with something like uh, this. That's like again because nobody can see it. But uh, what we can see here is 
is that uh, this is an energy system today. And it's dominated by fossil fuels. About 85% of all the energy that we use in the planet comes from fossil fuels still. It hasn't actually changed a lot in uh, recent. But we have to, uh, have to produce probably more energy because a lot of uh, people in the world are still without energy or without sufficient energy supplies. And also because we have to change our industries uh, so that they don't need to burn fossil fuels in their own processes. And this is going to need a lot of electricity. So we, we are probably, even, even though that we have to uh, be as efficient as we can, we also have to increase energy production almost certainly. And what this uh, shows here, we could show, is my guess of what the future is going to be looking like. And uh, this biggest piece here is wind power. And we have solar power, hydropower, some nuclear power, and then all the rest. I think this is something like this is possible system. There are some other people who say that solar power is going to be the biggest thing in source. I think it's going to be wind power that we can recall. But we have this big task ahead of us. And what this would mean in practice, the system that I saw just earlier, would mean that we would have to build 600,000 wind power plants every year. And this is not for one year, this is not for 10 years. This is for as long as we have this kind of facilitation. Every year, we would have to build 600,000 wind power plants. One plant would have to be completed and installed every 53 seconds, somewhere in the world. Now, this is a lot. But we are doing a lot of things already. If we if, uh, go to a um, container harbor one, a Sunday, and uh, think about like how many containers just like one ship can carry, and how much stuff we can produce. We are building trucks alone in the order of 3.5 million trucks every year. Was it like 50 million personal cars and uh, I don't know how many air, but it's thousands at least. So we can produce almost everything we want. Now, now the question is, do we want to do this? And like I said earlier, if we uh, make this kind of a, this is a little bit of a funny comparison because of course it's not that easy to uh, compare these things. But we can see that, uh, that the cost of a wind power plant is something between one to ten million dollars per plant. It depends on the size of the plant, of course, and whether you want to get it on the sea or and in 2018, which is the latest year where we, I have the numbers, uh, the world produced something like 20,000 uh, wind power plants. So if we want to build 600,000 of them, then we have to increase the production 30 times, right? Yeah. So, can we do it? We know that we can. Because in just in three years, uh, this is uh, what the Americans alone did. They are building those uh, airplanes, something like 3,000 airplanes. Yeah. Almost all of them were really light planes, they were more like hobby planes. They were not war machines, or at least most of them were not. And President Roosevelt asked in May 1940, this is long before the United States was in the war, long before this Pearl Harbor. He asked uh, for the Congress for funding to uh, start planning for capacity of 50,000 airplanes per year. And everybody uh, was basically using all the same arguments that we hear today. That this is impossible, can't be done, too expensive. We shouldn't be paying for other people's messes. And most, uh, most commonly that this is completely impossible, it can't be done. Now, in, in, uh, just like uh, a bit over three years later, in 1944, uh, the U.S. factories, among other things, produced 93,600 airplanes. All of them were much better, much heavier, much more expensive than 
anything that was produced in 1939. And this in addition to other things, like two aircraft carriers a week, 50 ships a day, and so forth. So I, I don't believe <coughs> anyone who says that this can't be done. Mm -hmm. We are so much, uh, uh, the world is so much wealthier than what is it was back then. Our productive capabilities have increased so much that it's almost magical. Like, for instance, in, uh, in the United States, where the steel industry has been in decline for 50 years now, and it's just a shadow of what it was once, they are still producing more steel than in the best day of the Second World War. It's after 50 years of decline. So what we would need now is something like six times the US Second World War production. It's, it's a lot, but it's totally do doable. The European Union alone could do this if we wanted. And <clears throat> I won't be uh, uh, worrying you too much about these graphs because uh, these are just some calculations that we have been doing for this. I mean, I'll just say that one thing uh, that would help us in this fight is that uh, states mass production. How many of you have heard about so-called economies of scale? So we would economy as well. So some of you have heard. So uh, what we have in mass production of anything, what makes mass production so interesting to engineers like me, is that the more you produce something, the better you get in producing. And more money you uh, you can spend on, let's say, tools and, and uh, machines for producing. So what happens is that price comes down. And this is responsible for the fact that we have there, as a camera for this meeting, we have a computer that is more powerful than a supercomputer of 1990. That's the reason why we can afford to use one as a camera. So the same thing would happen to uh, anything we would produce in huge amounts, like let's say wind power plants, solar panels, electric cars. Yeah. And if, if we are right here, we might be wrong, but if we are right here, then actually even the price of electricity would be coming down a lot. And this, this could well be much cheaper than what we have right now, but only after we have produced enough. <laughs> And we are going to be needing, like I said earlier, that we are going to be needing a lot of electricity. Because the basic strategy, how we know that we can decarbonize the entire society, has three steps. This is the simple version. Three step strategy is that we electrify everything, then we build a lot of low carbon electric power. It's electrify everything means that everything where we can use electricity instead of some burning fuels we should be using. This is not possible everywhere. There will be some places where we have to use fuels for a long time, like aviation. But, uh, but in all the, basically in all the places where we can, we need to be using electricity. Now the number three here is whatever we can do directly to electricity, which is a lot, but there are some things that are difficult to do with electricity alone. Then we would be doing uh, soon the chemistry based on electrolysis of water. Many of you have probably done this experiment with like uh, putting uh, you know, electric power into a can of water and then it produces gas. This is a very simple idea, very, very simple technology. But when we have hydrogen, when we have carbon, and when we have electricity, then you can keep those, your chemist and they, they can make basically anything from those uh, two, uh, three things. Now, of course, this is going to be a gigantic project in total. And we, it's a very big question that can we do this kind of a project without overcoming other planetary boundaries like biodiversity loss. This is something that we will be uh, way. We don't know the answer for that yet. But just in case, it would be better if we uh, 
to somehow figure out how to live with less, because then all these problems become so much easier to solve. And it might be that at this point we've been delaying so long that we can't uh, keep on going with this society that we have now. I see, I'm not really, really sure about that, but we, we have to make changes in our society. What we can decide right now is what kind of changes we want and whether we want them done like peacefully or not. But it's totally doable. Uh, we humans have made changes in our lifestyles before. There have been, for instance, in the history, there have been human societies that have consumed all the natural resources they have and then they have destroyed themselves. But we also have societies that have learned how to live within the boundaries of the environment. So we know that humans can change. And we can change our thinking. And we can, uh, we can decide here that the best move and the only, only way to win this game is not to play. So, <clears throat> I don't, this actually shouldn't be here because I think that everything that I've said is known to everybody of you here. Almost everyone. Oh, oh yes. So, so, what I should be saying to you what can we do here? I think like libraries have an extremely important role to play in, in the years ahead. And uh, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be frank with you that it's totally possible that uh, it, it gets worse before it gets better. And it's totally possible that at least part of Europe, for instance, basically slides into fascism some kind of dictatorships. Because these are hard problems, they are already visible in people's lives. They cause problems like uh, uh, forcing people to migrate, which then uh, it's, 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 it's wrong for the people who have to migrate, and it also causes unrest in countries where they migrate. So all kinds of like problems can be increased. They, they, they probably will increase before they do. But the more people have knowledge and understanding of what is happening, the better our probability is for surviving this argument. And I think like one important thing that libraries and public work can offer are better stories for you know being human. So now we have this dominating story that we have to be conquering the world and that you know, we need more and more. But perhaps there might be better stories somewhere. And I think there are. And I, I think that because people are basically story driven animals, that we have this story in our head that pretty much says that what we are going to be doing. If we can change the sto that story at least a little bit, then I think we could be doing a lot. So what are the better stories? What kind of stories we ought to be telling and, and uh, promoting to people and uh, making available? And then, of course, if, if the worst comes to worst, and if, if, if it's too late to save the civilization, this is also a possibility. All the other pre uh, previous big cultures have experienced the collapse. There, there is now, uh, we shouldn't be thinking that we are immune for. So, if that happens, then libraries will be even more important. Where else do we keep, you know, the basic knowledge? Because if some kind of a large-scale societal collapse occurs, what is then going to happen is almost certainly that every skill that is not relevant to, you know, the short term survival will be lost. And we are now in a situation where we have used up all the easily available resources in the world. There used to be a time when you could, uh, uh, you could go buy a, 
uh, suitable creek or river, and you could call it pieces of copper and gold. This is impossible now. We have used, used all the uh, coal deposits that are uh, just a short uh, way down below the surface. And there is a real possibility that if we lose enough of our knowledge and our capabilities, we can never get them back. Because we don't have the resources to do it. This is least impossible. So we have to keep up this, uh, this kind of stores of knowledge as well. But this is the worst case scenario. And I, I really hope that we are not going with that timeline. I hope this timeline where I'm in is going to be the best one. Or well, at least as, as good as it can get. But uh, it's also a possibility that we probably have to take seriously in the coming years. Because these, these, these things, they might take 100 years, they might occur in 10 years. You really can't predict. But we do know that our civilization is on the same kind of collision course as previous civilizations have been, that we know. But I know, uh, yeah. I do think still, honestly, that there is hope, a lot of hope, and we could build a better world for, for basically everyone. Because we would have to build that world on equality and respect of ourselves and others and, and nature. But this is going to be this decay. It's going to be hugely important. And I think that's the, you know, the reason for our people. So, thank you. Any questions?